So today I'm going to explain all the technical details of uh, Tom's build as we enjoy ourselves uh, about 30 minutes from West Palm Beach. So I'm going to go inside and explain that. Um, the way I'm going to do this is just going to follow the path of electricity. So when you have shore power or a generator, and this generator is mostly just used to run the air conditioner uh, all day long, um, that's going to flow through there into there. And I'm going to show you the actual wiring because I have that all open so you can see exactly where it goes. And just let me back out and uh, get a good image of that. Alrighty. So then through here is the factory wiring. They did not wrap it in uh, coverings like I did here. And it goes through and it feeds into this main breaker right here. And then it feeds out through. It goes into the gray cable, which follows through there, through there, and into this bottom side of the automatic transfer switch. Now when that's engaged, the plunger will actually go down and the plunger here, which is currently down, will pop up. If they're both up, that means that you have no power. And you can pop this case off without any screws. You just pop out the tabs that are on the top and the bottom. So then with this contactor depressed down, the power would flow through um, this wire right here, which goes through there through there and into the factory hole right there um, entirely unmodified from its original positioning and that feeds into the 50 amp breakers on the inside and then from the two 50 amp breakers there's all the other sub uh, breakers of 10 15 and 20 amps respectively for the different devices inside so now we're going to return back to this breaker box this wire right here feeding into this breaker right here which is a 50 amp breaker is designed to um, just act as a supplemental breaker if we don't trust the 50 amp breaker at whatever source you happen to be at we have this uh, Nader breaker which is um, quite reliable in my opinion and then the output of that here as you can see we have the thicker 50 gauge wires but we also have um, some 10 gauge wires that are connected into the neutral and the uh, L1 of this system here and those actually are these wires here they flow through there through there oh and we're turning the camera and they flow into the inputs, which is a green. And, and there you can see it over there as well. So they flow into the input of the inverters. Sorry for the crooked angle. Here's a better angle. So the wires come down through there and they go over and into the inverters there. There's actually a little bit of tape on each uh, wire that indicates where it is. So if there's blue tape on that wire there, you can trace up and find the other orange wire that has blue tape on it. Oh, we rotate it again, but it's right there. So you can see which wire goes where with the tape. If you were wondering why there's little bits of colored tape on everything. And then from these output wires, um, which is controlled by this switch right here. So when I clip this off, I'm going to become, I would be cutting this output wire from here. They come together there, up through there, and they actually bypass over the top of this. And then they actually feed into this right here. Now what you're, now we have a bridge in our system where the neutral 
is connected to the L1 or the hot wire of each of those and then it bridges L1 and L2 as we can see on the other side L the red wire which is L2 is bridged over so we do not have a 240 volt input because you can either have a 240 volt input or a 120 volt input but you can't have both unless you were to make this much more complicated and we're not trying to do that so we oh, we have a 120 uh, volt input but we can still do the full 50 amps because we're teaming up those two uh, 10 gauge wires simultaneously and then they're feeding into the factory wires right there that go into the um, system control center with the 50 amp breakers again another set of 50 amp breakers so the purpose of this right here is pretty much just to protect the um, UPS units as well as the automatic transfer switch there as well as we just want to make sure that there's an additional breaker other than what we have on the device and we have this outside. Um, this also makes it very easy to just kind of turn off the power input. Like I can do it right now but because we're not hooked up to shore or generator power absolutely nothing happened. And this breaker right here while I'm explaining them controls this outlet right here. Now I was able to pull uh, 2,000 watts out of this outlet right here without a problem. It's got the USB-C ports and the high-speed USBs and uh, 20 amp outlets so it's a nice little cheater um, if you want to get a plug through there. There is a hole in the floor right here that I would run that wire down through and you could actually use this to power another camper. Um, in terms of battery capacity, if you wanted to sacrifice running your air conditioner, you could keep their refrigerator going for days on solar, because this is a full power system with more than enough solar and battery power to keep everything running, as you can see there, but we're not, we're not to that yet. We're back to the electricity. So as the power flows from the grow lot units, over that into this it's going to automatically transfer it over now this has priority transfer meaning if the generator is running and the inverters are off then it will fall back to just essentially factory mode where the um, power just is all going to be coming from the generator and if the generator were to stop running all the power on the inside were to stop now once you turn the inverters on, this is going to take priority and after one minute it's going to automatically switch back on and I have video of that happening yet, uh, that I took yesterday. So that means that if the generator is running or not running um, independently, um, so with the inverters kept in the on position, which they should always be kept in the on position, the um, power is always going to be applying and if the generator is running that's just going to be fueling the um, devices inside plus putting a fixed amount of power into the battery that is selectable by option number 11, which is the only option that we really have to change on this system. Uh, now this is set up for a full 50 amp uh, service, so it is designed that you should be able to charge at a fast rate the battery while simultaneously powering a full, you know, 5,000 watts on the inside. So that is one of the options that we have with this design here. And let's see if I can explain anything else. Oh yes, let's explain this red cord right here which is live and that is oddly enough connected to the output of this because it was just kind of a last minute add-on and it feeds through that existing hole through here here we can see it's tagged red again and it feeds into this breaker right here which is a 30 amp breaker which is rated for the wire and then it feeds into that 20 amp outlet right there 
and that's what I was using to recharge my work vehicle and it can do the 2000 watts. So I just want to explain the origin of that wire and how it connects into the system. And that uh, this outlet is going to be active whenever all the AC power is active. And I did not want to go through the effort of trying to tie it into the existing wire. I wanted to make an additional dedicated uh, high power circuit. We could have gone with an actual RV 30 amp cord, like a female. Um, and that's one of the options that we have, but I asked and that was not um, selected, so it just went with this right here. But this design is actually made for a 30 amp cord so that you can plug another camper into you. Because when you have uh, the equivalent of 1800 amp hours of 12 volt power, you have more than enough to keep someone's uh, mini fridge running without any impact on your own power. So here's just a close-up of these two systems here. You can see the factory system is wired as a 240, which is why we have the L2 red cable going in through there. But as in this system here, we actually have the um, L1 and the L2 bridged. And that's an important factor to remember uh, in this system and also why we have the automatic transfer switch, because we can't have both a because this allows us to get 240 volts into the coach when we have a 50 amp uh, 240 volt source. But in terms of charging, we're only going to be pulling 120 volts from this from the system, and that's the um, that's the limitation that we're working at, so that we can keep compatibility when we are running a 30 amp uh, 120 volt single phase uh, generator. So this is definitely the design that I would go with because it allows for the maximum flexibility of both using um, more than 5,000 watts of power and sticking with the uh, 30 amp limit while also giving you the full 240. So here's the solar cables. You can see that the colored tape on them, uh, blue, red, blue, and uh, single strike green is used to indicate uh, which wires they are. And these are connected into the inverters here. And if I can move it around, we have a similar wires going in right here. Both of those wires feed through here and they're connected. These are outdoor PV double coated wires, so they do not need to have any type of wire protective wrap on them. You can leave these outside banging around and they're completely fine. It's um, expensive, highly durable wire, so just one of the benefits of using that and we have them wrapping through here and we have them going through um, this breaker controls that one and the, that breaker controls that one and this is just for the solar it's a 50 amp breaker the solar that's currently in the system is nowhere near 50 amps um, but the system can take 50 amps so the breaker more or less just functions as an on-off switch since we're never actually going to hit 50 amps but we actually could as you can load up, uh, I, I think like 4,500 watts of solar to this thing. Um, if you were to use this into a residential application or go park this thing on a farm somewhere, you'd be able to hook it up to a very large solar array. And consequently, uh, 5,000 watts of solar panels is only about $5,000, so it's not really outside of the reason of cost that you would want to do that and then just set yourself up time and I do apologize that we are crooked in this design because everything is mounted to the wall <laughs> what's uh what's straight now is crooked again and it has to be rotated so these solar wires go ahead and they run up and over and they run into the outside so here the solar wires they go through a hole in the wall and they come out right here and then they go up this piece of aluminum channel here they've been installed for about a year now and they go up and over and as you can see by this they are all color coded to match the inside so that covers the solar this can uh, you can upgrade these independently with something much bigger and as better and better panels come out it's very very easy to replace the uh, panels on the roof and move them around 
Um, one guy, one ladder, and um, not too difficult at all. I was able to remove the panels and put them back up there pretty quickly. All right, so the batteries are all right here. The equivalent of 1800 amp hours of 12 volt lithium. And this is what they all look like. All stacked and uh, glued together. And there's actually walls that go in to frame all this in. Right here. So what you're looking at there is the active um, capacitor um, balancer. That is a 5 amp version of that and it uses the 16 gauge wires that you see running there. That's those ribbon cables. And those run to all of the cells and they make sure that each one of the independent battery packs is completely balanced through its life cycle. Kind of stealing from the lowest step, uh, from the highest cell to give to the lowest cell. And it uses those capacitor bank right there to um, do that. So it's pretty cool um, technology. It's definitely not necessary on a brand new pack, but as the life expectancy of this pack um, gets on and gets older, um, the lowest cell is going to determine the, uh, the capacity of that, and this is going to basically fix it so that the whole thing will be actively balanced through its entire life cycle. And each of the strings of batteries there is connected with an independent 100 amp battery management system controlled by Bluetooth. And that uses passive technology as well as it's fully programmable via Bluetooth with its own uh, dual temperature sensors, which explains some of the wires that you see running through the system and that, that are taped there and there. And you can also see them right there and there and a little bit up there as well. You see the Kapton tape as well as the um, very high bond adhesive which is designed to secure the batteries to the sidewall so that they don't bang around and just in case uh, we don't want any uh, we don't want contact, so we have a little bit of a spacer there. Now, underneath the shrink wrap is actually is actually plastic framing, so that it's not just a layer of uh, shrink wrap between that and the bare metal cell. There is more plastic behind that as a safety feature. And since we're not really pushing these batteries all that much, these are capable of incredible power with. You're talking 50 volts at 200 amps, so about 10,000 watts output is its maximum continuous. And we're really not ever going to be pushing that, pushing it that hard. And our charge rate is about half of that as well. And again, that would be a really fast charge rate that we're really not going to be pushing that much. We're even, uh, we're just not really <laughs> needing it. So there's really no risk here. Now you can see that the batteries are raised up about one inch off of the uh, ground here. And let me just go ahead and slide this first panel into place. This has been in place for about a year now, so it's, uh, it's a bit dirty. But you can see how that slides into place. So if you were to leave this open, and there's also a glass panel right there and there that cover that so if you were to leave this bay open you would be totally fine as that's going to shield the batteries and the top of the glass is right there so unless the water was going to come in and then come up and then over and then on top you're not really going to have an issue you'd have to be spraying it up from the bottom so that's the uh, solution that we have with these. Um, we, they, are, they are temperature controlled, but the temperature um, maximum is somewhere around 145 degrees Celsius, which you can get if you were to leave this exposed to the sun. But in, uh, as a temperature that occurs in uh, the United States of America, that just doesn't really happen. So they're generally good. And in terms of cold weather, um, while it does get cold, um, enough in certain parts uh, 
Um, and these can handle uh, freezing temperatures and then they'll just shut down and they can go like to like negative 20 or something and be fine. But at that point, there's a lot of other systems here that are not designed for that type of temperature fluctuation, including things like the composites and stuff and the flooring and the adhesives used. So it's not recommended to like let all the fluids in this thing freeze. Because even things like hydraulic fluid, I'm not sure what kind of a uh, temperature they can take. And uh, just wouldn't suggest it. Go somewhere warmer. So let's go ahead and explain these. Now these are simply stacked around that horizontal pipe so that I can take use of that space that otherwise was kind of blocked off and didn't really give us that much. And that's the primary purpose of that, to kind of frame this all off and make an area that you can leave it open to the elements and it can get wet and it's fine and every, and things can bash around inside of it and everything here is protected and totally fine. Um, you will see that I have these big cables out here because I'm going to take this 12 volt battery section here and I'm going to remove it to just kind of show the uh, back end area where all the cables are. Um, but that's the reason for it is just so it's designed to be removed. We removed and worked at the 48 volt section of it because that 12 volt battery section, you can actually count the eight segments there. Each is um, lithium iron phosphate cells. Um, but, the, with the, but we're going with the cylindrical cells and not the prismatic cells. As the cylindrical cells have uh, several key advantages, including not requiring uh, compression and um, it's just a little bit more expensive technology than the um, less expensive cheap prismatic cells, I guess. Uh, um, and it's just a little bit more effort to put, to put all together. I think is the biggest difference is the effort involved in all of this for the maximum redundancy is pretty high. And that would be the issue. So if one of these cells were to get damaged, the system would just, um, if it's completely broken, like zeroed out, it'll just kick into the safety system and it delete itself. But the system would still continue to function. It wouldn't necessarily break it. And if it were just to be like a dud or a bad cell, um, I did. I do have a few extras just in case. But uh, we've had this for a while, and that's, that does not seem to be the case. Um, but if it was the uh, um, auto. Uh, it would be auto-corrected by the active balancing. So even if it was, you know, like they're all 100 amp hour cells, except for this one's only clocking in at 50, um, if that were to happen, then with the auto-correction there, that would be mitigated out throughout the entire pack and you would not really see it, especially with the um, speeds of the systems and the way that they work independently, as you can actually have one pack, um, you know, a few volts up above or below another pack and they'll just be equalizing. So they, they do work independently to within a certain limit. Um, uh, though, I mean, I wouldn't try to, you know, have them, I wouldn't try to put a fully charged and a completely empty charge packed together, but if they were to connect, the BMS would just realize that that's not going to happen and just shut it down. And then you can, and it would just require that you log in with the Bluetooth application and then to just manually turn it on when the two battery packs are synced, if it can't automatically do it. But for my testing purposes, um, I was able to get them to automatically do it, to turn them on and turn them off and to reboot them and to have them sync with a little bit of a voltage gap. Um, it, it takes a long time to do a voltage gap, so you would have to like, it would have to be turned off for a very long time. And I don't understand any circumstances why they would be turning themselves off um, <laughs> or on again ever. And according to the little uh, application log, they never actually did that during the course of the system running so uh, this is just for the future proofing of this because I think this type of technology is important and key and should be utilized in everyone's design because with the active balancers and with all the independent systems you're never going to have like an oops moment where something doesn't work even with the inverters themselves the reason why we go with two and two smaller inverters instead of one larger inverter is the redundancy. If that inverter just stopped working, totally fine. That one's going to be completely fine. It requires a slight programming change and in fact, I bet it'll actually work without it. It might just, it might just put up a little bit of a fuss and beep at him, but I bet if I were to completely pull it out that it would work just fine.
and it would send power to the entire system because we're going for maximum redundancy. Like if you were to be off grid somewhere where you don't have access to tools and parts, the ability for the systems to run independently of each other is, is quite key importance. And that's why we have what might look like some people to be too complicated of a system. Because let's assume that for whatever reason, we just want to turn all this off and we're going to let our buddy use our camper. But we don't trust them to do this, or for some reason we just want to turn it off. You can just do that. You can just switch all these off, turn off the breakers right there, which I will point to in just a minute here. All right, so these are the two breakers. These are the master uh, DC breakers. You click those off and it will shut off the battery power to the inverters. Now, right now when, the, when there's actually solar power coming in, which is indicated by a line going from there into the battery, then, you will let, then the inverters will actually stay on. And if you want them to fully power cycle, it is necessary to come to this and flip off the AC power and the solar power. So you cut off all, it, all sources of power to the, to the systems, and then they will finally turn off. So I was explaining the, um, again, independent breakers for independent systems. So we're going with the redundancy issue. If there was an issue with one of these inverters, we'd be able to just flip off one of the breakers, and the other one would work. And the same thing with here, with doing the batteries, just a more um, systems here. Now the, the, the battery management system, if you were to drain it down and then leave it alone, it actually will turn itself off. And that would be if you were to put this thing into deep storage and the battery were to just go completely dead because it's literally inside somewhere not getting any solar power. And in order to prevent the battery from actually damaging itself by having that little tiny LED light literally drain it down to zero, <laughs> which would take a super long time. But if you were to have it in storage for years, what, it, what you would do with the system is you actually plug something into that little port right there. Um, there's a USB end and one is a little 9 volt end. And you pl plug it into that right there. And that will go ahead and wake the system up because it will put everything into a deep freeze. Um, that also would kick on in the event that the battery hit some kind of warning temperature, like it got so hot that the cells might be damaged, or so cold that the cells might be damaged. And in that case, it'll actually it will not turn itself back on again, and it's, it'll force the system off. Uh, so we have a few um, safeties like that, that, that force interaction with the user in the event that there's something that could be unsafe. But otherwise, everything is just entirely automated. Even if the system were to just run out of power, at night with the air conditioner and the next day once the system has enough power it'll go ahead and start everything up again so you don't have to uh, manually do anything it's just more or less automated and all right so we have a water detection alarm um, which I'm going to trigger right now If you were to hear that alarm going off, you would be able to just take this little switch here and just turn that guy off, and that would silence the alarm. And then just remember to turn it back on. But it's very, very sensitive, literally just uh, licking my finger and touching that sensor is enough to trigger it. Um, that trigger in other systems is used to uh, switch things on and off, but in this case it's just designed to be loud enough to uh, let you know that this compartment is flooding, but you would have a full inch of water up here, and there are two drain holes. Additionally, um, the water actually would just drain underneath this, so to another hole on the other side. So the odds that you would have an inch of water are pretty high, but if you were to, we're just trying to get an extra alarm, but it's not necessary to trigger anything off because of we're just looking for the redundancy. We have already factored in what would happen with the water, and we're just trying to trigger that alarm in that case. So here's a view of how it's wired up. 
pretty much just follow the manual and don't listen to uh, anything that would deviate from that. Um, oh, here's a mounting option. These are actually mounted on aluminum with actually a space behind this. And this is a high temperature resistant um, um, artificial surface. So this is completely fine to be warm. If this was something like automotive carpet or, or some other type of flammable surface or surface that would catch fire if you were to spark it, then I typically would go with a sheet of plexiglass as it is both non-conductive, relatively inexpensive, and being clear, it doesn't really um, make you have to choose, deviate from the current um, artistic style of it. can't think of anything else to explain. Um, in the event that we, you get an air code on the systems, one of the things to check would be those connectors right there, the serial plugs and the data cord and the uh, power sharing cords. That's the two gray cords you see there and the two greens. Um, if they're ever unplugged, you'll, um, it'll beep an air code, like I think maybe 56. It could be a number of them. Just put it back in. Um, they're actually screwed in right now, but depending on how things get jostled and whatnot, um, I just figured I would mention that. There is a black reset button right there. It's uh, a built-in 40 amp circuit breaker. Um, it's very unlikely to trip since we uh, uh, typically just aren't pulling that much power, but I did want to mention that it's there. Never in my experience has it ever tripped, but it could. And the USB port to connect it up to the system is right there. If you want to do uh, get computer logging, you just need to grab yourself a little Windows computer and it'll kind of graph everything for you, which is kind of cool if you care about such things. I've never met a person who did, but one of these days someone will. <laughs> and they'll be able to do it. For the connectors, I do not use wire nuts, but I use Wagos. And one of the advantage of the Wago connectors is that you can physically see the terminals uh, right in the center of the screen going through the material. If I can get it from this side as well. Yeah, you can, if I can do the zoom, you can physically see the connectors are touching the pl uh, plastic. And that visual indicator is a really great way to um, just know that it's solid locked in there. And this is uh, far superior to cable nuts or anything else. And I would be, uh, I would be uh, suggesting anyone else use. The factory did not protect this existing cable. They just looped it through one of these plastic um, uh, units. And I decided that I was not going to be undoing what the factory did, um, but in all of my cases, any times wires are held together, there you see protective wrap on there so that the wires are not getting any friction, and it kind of just bundles them all together. And I use waterproof connectors on the outsides, not because they're necessary, but just because I prefer them to the metal style. And what I mean by that is this is the uh, residential metal style and then this is the uh, automotive gland and that's just how I prefer because it gets a nice tight connection in there. This was just, I didn't know what to do with the extra wrap. <laughs> it wouldn't all fit through despite how hard I did just because of the design of it. So it's kind of ugly but it's secure. Let's go through the settings of this right now. So, it says um, under the battery, it says solar utility. That is how the battery is going to be charging. And above the SL, which stands for slave, it says UTI first. That stands for utility first. So anytime it's hooked up to a generator or shore power, it's going to want to take as much of that power as possible. By pressing and holding the enter key, 
we're going to get to the menu system. So this is where we set utility. I'm going to go ahead and change that arbitrarily to solar or perhaps solar backup utility. Now solar backup utility is when you are on grid power or have a generator with an auto start. Once the battery gets low to a certain point, it'll automatically kick on your generator or connect to shore power, recharging the system or just maintaining you, depending on your settings. And then, one, and then once solar has risen you to a sufficiently high level, it will, um, or the grid has risen the battery to a sufficiently high level, depending on your settings. Then the uh, when that's based on the battery voltage, but once it's gone up to like 75%, it'll switch back over and disconnect from the grid or shut the generator down, and it will continue to run on solar and battery power. So that's what that setting is. Um, that would be what you would use if you were paying a lot of money per kilowatt hour somewhere. And that's the utility setting. So we're going to go ahead and just change that to solar. And then if we were to go ahead and press the up or down button, we would cycle through the settings. But I'm just going to hit escape. And I just wanted to show that right there it says solar first. So that's the setting that we just changed. So just so I can explain how the settings affect what we see on screen. This is the maximum charge rate. It's set to 80. No reason to mess with this setting. Um, this is the AC input acceptability mode. The options for this are generator, uninterruptible power supply, and appliance mode. Um, in your particular system with your generator, any of these would work, but if you were to hook it up to a dirtier power source, there is a certain point at which it would reject the power as uh, not good enough. So I'm going to just go ahead and put this on UPS mode. And we're going to go through this. Uh, settings, SDS, uh, don't mess with it. It's just um, a low power shutdown mode. But you typically always have things running, so there's really no reason to do that. But if you were to optimize your system, you could have one of these. Uh, sh I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't. <laughs> so leave it alone. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Um, this is America. 120 volts AC is what you want. Don't change it. This is America. 60 hertz uh, is what you want. Don't change it. Don't change it. Ah, number 11, the setting you actually do change. You press the enter button once to change it. Press it until it beeps. And now you can go through and cycle the values. If you pick a value of 100 amps, 199 amps, you go back to this. You see it reset itself to zero because that's not an option. The uh, acceptable options are between 0 and 40. 40 uh, amps at 50 uh, volts recommend is um, 2,000 watts, which is the max AC power input that we have per this one inverter here. Now, when you combine that with solar input, your max charge is actually 80. So it's half can come from solar and half can come from um, AC power. But let's go ahead and change this to a real value. We're going to go ahead and press enter because we're not changing the hundreds. We're just going to we're going to change this to 12. So we're going to go up to number one. Press enter. Up twice to go to number two. Press enter, and now you see that number has stayed at 12. So now if we go press down because this was flashing, it's now changing the setting number. And now we see setting number 11 has been changed to 12. So we know the setting is good and it's going to work. If I had set it to something incorrect, like 212, uh, 211, we can see that when I go back to number 11, it has put itself 
back to 12 amps because the, uh, the value of 211 amps is not valid. But we're going to go ahead and zero that out again. So, um, that's the setting that you're really going to have to change the most. Now, setting number 12 and 13 are the settings used by the solar backup utility that would pick the voltage that the system would go to the grid for which in this case would be 51, and then once the battery hits 54 volts, the setting here, it would go back to battery and solar power. Um, this is most useful when you have a generator with an auto start feature, which is triggered by the dry contacts. This is how the charging rate. This is solar and utility. If I change this value to utility, it'll only charge with utility. If I ch chain this one, will be combined. Uh, this wing will be charging with solar only, and this thing will be only only solar. And this is solar and utility charging. Don't think that really needs to be explained um, any more than just what it is depending on what you want charging the battery and what you don't want charging the battery. In this case, we want solar and utility, um, which utility could be a generator or shore power. This is for the uh, beep on, light, or LED backlight on, alarm on, it gets too low, it'll go beep, beep, beep. Bypass disabled. This can also be turned to bypass enabled. Um, maximum battery voltage, don't change this value. Um, full battery voltage, don't change it. And the cutoff voltage, don't change it. And these settings I'm not sure of because they are all new with the firmware update. But I can't think of anything else to add um, to this video at the moment, other than I really like the um, redundant design of this. This was perfect for an off-grid cabin or a boat or somewhere else where um, you would need the redundancy in both the inverters and in the batteries and even in the backup system, which is just a mirror of the factory backup system. We have a thousand watt inverter here that pretty much just stands on standby. And as soon as there is power lost to this, it automatically kicks on. It connects to that stack of batteries right there, which is two. 12 volt batteries put together with an independent battery management system. So you one battery management system want to shut the system off, the other battery would still function, giving additional redundancy connected through those breakers right there. And that will power the refrigerator at, for about, um, assuming the inside temperature is about 77 degrees, it'll the refrigerator will pull one kilowatt hour and 12 volt batteries at 100 amp hours is about 2.5 kilowatt hours of power. So you'd get about two and a half days um, or roughly uh, 50, uh, 60 hours of, uh, of battery life, which is pretty good after the primary system fails because after 60 hours, the sun is likely going to go ahead and automatically kick this system on again. So even if, so, if these systems are not doing anything, they actually will just shut down, but they will turn themselves on again automatically to capture the sun, and they will do that until the battery is full, in which case they will not turn themselves on again until uh, there is a need. So everything is optimized for off-grid. And... In the event that the interior gets incredibly hot, that 2.5 kilowatt hours of battery power is going to be able to run that refrigerator for at least a full day. And that gives you just a sense of mind that you're not going to come home to a bunch of stinky, uh, to a stinky house and a bunch of uh, destroyed groceries. And that's really important. Um, 
one of the things that I did is this plate right here used to contain all the other solar components and electronics and the most terrible thing about that is is that when you climbed in here if you touched your hand up here you would have ground and positive unfused connections all throughout this and with everything lined up behind here with this little bar we're gonna be able to put some uh, plastic um, uh, walls in or maybe even a net and just block all this off so all of this stuff can't get hurt by anything that were to bang around because we have loose pipes here and exposed wires and I covered everything up and cleaned this up for maximum space because you got to figure we added something that is bigger and more powerful than the Tesla power wall and we did it with roughly the same size and weight and a much smaller um, physical footprint. This takes up very little space. You figure we only lost about a hand worth of gap. We're gonna be able to put a nice glass wall in here. And we only lost about, uh, I wanna say about a foot, about one, two hand lengths of space in here, which was already blocked by this pipe anyway, which goes at a weird angle. So we would have had to box all of this off and essentially uh, we lost very minimal space and I think it's a really great design aspect. Um, and the, with this battery design, this could be reconfigured at a later date to be a 24 or a 12 volt pack and I think that gives these cells a maximum life and maximum reusability. You should be expecting not just the standard 10 year life, but with all of these additional uh, safety constraints, you should be expecting probably 15 to 20 years um, based on uh, what every manufacturer is warranting these batteries for because these are the batteries that have the exceptionally long warranties for the uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries you typically see 10 years